I'll just say a few words about the Sherry Endowment that makes this event possible, and then I'll introduce our reader tonight, Lindy Ginian. Then I'm going to bend this down a little bit because I think we're probably about the same height. Okay. okay. The Pearl Anderson Sherry Memorial Poetry Reading and Lecture honored the life and work of former University of Chicago student Pearl Andelson Sherry. Established in 1997 through a gift from the Sherry family, the Pearl Andelson Sherry Memorial Fund annually brings a major contemporary poet to the University of Chicago to work with students and to present the Pearl Andelson Sherry Memorial Poetry Reading and Lecture. Thanks also to the Global Voices series here at International House and to International House itself for making this lovely space available. At the end of the Arabian Nights, as translated by the 19th century explorer, soldier, linguist, spy, and poet, Sir Richard Burton, the legendary King Shariar says to a presumably exhausted Scheherazade, O oh, wise and subtle one, you've taught me many lessons, letting me see that every man is at the call of fate. You've made me consider the words of kings and peoples passed away, You've told me some things which were strange, and many that were worthy of reflection. I've listened to you for a thousand nights and one night, and now my soul is changed and joyful. It beats with an appetite for life. We have only one night, not a thousand and one, to hear Lynn Higinian read from her work this evening. But we'll surely hear things which are strange, and many that are worthy of reflection. And if you believe in something resembling the soul, yours, like King Shariar's, will be too, in the end, with a renewed appetite for life. Hijinian is the Scheherazade of modern American poetry, a master mistress of delay and deferral, of digressions and diversions, of detour and detournement. Like Burton's Sultaness, she makes an exquisite literary origami of narration itself in order to unfold how stories, ghost stories, love stories, shaggy dog stories, stories within stories, stories about stories, help to keep us alive. The rambling old woman never finishes her stories, writes this highly self-aware and self-critical poet toward the end of The Fatalist. It is said that she is postponing her death, could be. But this postmodern mother goose deepens and extends our sense of life through the fractured fairy tales, deconstructed Russian novels, and procedural autobiographies of her art. Midway through a recent poem, Circus, Eugenian makes a surprise appearance in her own textual universe. A precocious student named Graciela has had the temerity to write a paper on an obscure writer who somehow seems to offend the literary sensibilities of her disapproving teacher, Sally Dover. Sally Dover has penalized Graciela for writing her book report on Lynn Higinian. A minor writer, says Sally Dover. In fact, unknown. I've never heard of her. And the examples are obscure. And uh, Sally Dover even gives Graciela a great C. This sly little parable of literary reception just goes to show that the only person who could conceivably get away with calling Lynn Higinian a minor writer these days is Lynn Higinian. Like all good parables, however, this one has philosophical reverberations. There's nothing major or revolutionary except the minor, right to Liz and Gattari. And throughout a literary career of both major and revolutionary impact, Higinian has always remained true to the ethos of minor writing as a woman, as a literary outsider, as a decentered dissenter. She is, like Deleuze and Guattari's Kafka, a sort of stranger within her own language. For hers is a writing in which the language of sense is traversed by a line of escape. And marvelously, this escape is an escape into, not from, the political. If Scheherazade's narrative detours prolong her life. They also have practical consequences for the good of the state. Scheherazade told her instructive tales to the governor 
and after that, he governed better, writes the poet. There may be future governors in the audience tonight. To them I say, listen well. Please join me in welcoming Lynn Hitchinian. I have never been more graciously introduced. Um, I hear a little feedback. Is that? OK, I guess it's normal. Um, I uh, am going to read from a manuscript um, for which that introduction was peculiarly appropriate. Um, which its title is The Book of a Thousand Eyes, and uh, it is actually a, a uh, homage to Scheherazade. And I won't say anything more about it than that and just get to the business of reading it. Um, This is like my office. Like <laughs> there, now I'm ready. Um, th this is comprised of a series of night works, and they don't have titles, or rarely have titles. And I, I'll just pace it so that you can hear when a new one has started. Um, is the sound OK? OK, good. A straight rain is rare, and doors have suspicions, and I hold that names begin histories and that the last century was a cruel one. I am pretending to be a truck in Mexico. I am a woman with a long neck and a good burden, and I waddle efficiently. Activity never sleeps, and no tale of crumbling cliffs can be a short one. I have to shift weight favorably. Happiness can't be settled. I brush my left knee twice, my right once, my left twice again, and in that way advance. The alphabet and the cello can represent horses, but I can only pretend to be a dog slurping pudding. After the 55 minutes it takes to finish, my legs tremble. All is forgiven. Yesterday is going the way of tomorrow indirectly, and the heat of the sun is inadequate at this depth. I see the moon. The verbs ought and can lack infinity, and somewhere between 1957, when the heat of the dry sun naughtily struck me, and now, when my secrets combine in the new order of cold rains and night winds, a lot has happened. Long phrases are made up of short phrases that bear everything in vain or all in fun for your sake, and step by step, precisely, I too can spring. I'd attributed entirety to the cattle, self-sufficient solar calm from which nothing more was to be learned in a bright place, bellied by shade, one hemisphere with the other implied, where they might be twins so gentle together, nothing more to be learned, since one can't be governed by superstitions, and omens are too com incompletely informative. One wouldn't say of something that moves from one place to another that it's displaced. Take, for example, the backing, beeping truck that I can hear maneuvering in the dark like a big animal working its way out of a thicket. To draw a perfect circle or triangle is out of a young child's reach, but the resulting misshapen geometry in the drawing is all the more expressive. If conscious thought can't make sense of this, then one should let the unconscious try. The pastures, in spite of the rain, or perhaps because of it, are choked with brambles, an impediment to travel, even of a few feet. But in late summer, they are so rich with berries that little travel, less than a foot, is required to obtain a feast. But the skies are dark, all of them. Red and blue icing is spread along the top of the cement garden wall and the thick railing of the stairs leading up to the front door. But when anyone puts their tongue to it, they find it disappointing, even disgusting. 
The unconscious mind can make a whole of what the conscious mind knows to be disparate, disconnected, diverse. This alone is reason enough to question the possible existence of faith, the meaning of art, the existence of different temporalities, or meaning itself. I lean into the wind as if wanting to get a better look at what's on the ground. The truck is driverless, and to me at least, it is ineluctably abstract. I have no idea where it will go next. I have only the vaguest idea how its engine works. I confess to being pleased with myself. I look nice, slender, young, with dark hair attractively cut. It hangs just below my ears. I've been out horseback riding for the first time in years. I watch myself coming out of the bedroom where I must have just been looking at my image in the mirror. It is obvious that I feel gratified, good, pleased at life. An internal conflict is not necessarily a mistake. It may be rather evidence of pervasive, inescapable social and historical conflicts. I can't extricate myself from them, but they aren't my fault. I've got some carrots, broccoli florets, and bits of radish to feed to the horses. They don't like the radishes. In 1977, out of a world total of 50,047 translations of books, 19,577 were from English. The nearest competitors were Russian, 6,771, and French, 6,054. Regardless of language, all seven girls in the saga are identical. But this is the result of a technological inadequacy. Their creator couldn't draw, and so he used found images of little girls as his ever replicable models, tracing them into his drawing. Regardless of the diversity of their concerns, they come to them with only the one body. Similarly, ideas are apt to conceal the suffering or pleasure sedimented in them. I should mention monuments. They are always rooted in ideology. I can smell diesel and the scent of mown hay. I notice a slight stirring of air. I don't forget to toss some carrots to the big, goofy, dark brown horse. I don't like him very much, and he keeps himself slightly apart from the others. The greedy black horse, mouth open, exposing his big teeth, thrusts his head toward the broccoli in my hand. Out the window, I can see a uniformly gray, but not black sky, the color of dry cement. I hesitate to go into the office, but I've every right to do so, and so I enter even though I'm feeling pressed for time and would have dreaded the now inevitable interruptions if I'd known they were going to occur. There are already six other people in the room, including someone on a table, legs up, undergoing a pelvic exam. Progress can delude us into thinking we are less vulnerable than in fact we are. And that thought occurs to me. Leo, as that thought occurs to me, Leo is given an injection into his testicles and he recoils slightly, says, ouch. Thus nature reminds us of our unnaturalness and also of what we have done to nature. Then he's off the table, and even as I'm apologizing for intruding, he is gaily greeting me, holding a towel around his midriff, but otherwise naked. There are seven of us, including a blonde young woman named Cynthia, or perhaps Melissa. Leo is our guide, a jovial and erudite native of the region. He tells us with enthusiasm about a certain monument that's situated somewhere in the surrounding <coughs> mountains. It's called Magna Grito, but is known locally as Campe Proviso. It occupies a few acres with extensive grounds, its gardens laid out geometrically. Cynthia, if that's her name, it might be Melissa, wants to set out immediately for Magna Grito, and she motions towards some high mountain peaks on the other side of town. There are bandits in the area, and they've been known to snatch stragglers wandering along this path. Where now is Cynthia Melissa? The landscape is green, rock-strewn, forested, mountainous. The sky is blue, the sun is pleasant, it's beautiful. This is Campe Proviso. It's the only really long one. I went to sleep in a pink hat, and when I awoke, I was sucking my gums. I telephoned my friend who lives in a crater, and when she spoke, I answered. I took out a loan as if it were a cow that I was moving to higher pasture, and when winter came, I climbed a pine tree. Passion itself is not repetitious, but it can result in delirious reserves. 
the things said over and over are sensuous signs of memory. But words say something more each time and sustain our reputation, and their real simplicities are like bees drawn together while knowledge, that strong feeling of pleasure, is best called a transition as it takes one thing to the next. I long to look like Audrey Hepburn under a big rain hat. <laughs> That's confessional poetry. <laughs> I wake. I wait to remember my dream, which would be dull to anyone else, but which could remind me of a stimulating day, the day that inspired it. There are details to that day I hadn't noticed during it, something resulting in a rainbow or a ratio, an intransigence or logic. In the dream, I sailed, stole, stalled, was jailed. My companion, a scientist, described his imp impressions and analyzed what we'd experienced much better than I could have done. I remember that an intricate corral held the shipboard animals. They were shaded by the dense and sturdy sails. Overhead, birds, which in real life could be called terns, but there were called tongs, passed over our embraces. We followed them with our binoculars. We identified them and characterized them as desperately casting Plato shadows. An entire day went by. The circumstances remained under erotic analysis, dreamed in self-defense. But that only means that the situation, with its shifting expectations, will begin again. Dawn occurs and is varied. Dawn comes to bear, dawn coming to compose. Dawn is capricious casually. It isn't clarity that causes the sun to appear at break of day. It's the hour. <coughs> Wait, I'm going to get some water here. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> All right, begin again. Dawn occurs and is varied. Dawn comes to bear, dawn coming to compose. Dawn is capricious casually. It isn't clarity that causes the sun to appear at break of day. It's the hour at which I most vividly dream that I hesitate. The dawn rhapsody is drawn up and out. The light sweeps the chill cliff I'm scaling. I can speak at dawn, but at dawn the letters A through Z terrify me. Time was I wouldn't have slowly pondered, but now I brush my knees. On the gray scale, the light strengthens, but I have never until now discerned a quantity of dawn. Dawn answers. The horizon faces, flushes. The cheats are ashamed. The prayers of prayers go on. Procrastination must eventually come to an end. This dawn entails. It has implications, and I am among them. Meanwhile, I'm fine, and so is the weather. Now our undertaking begins. I come out from a misunderstanding and see the situation anew. Those who predicted rain have been proven wrong and are to be reprimanded by the light on the wall of the room in which I find myself. I'm up. The birds for song have the trees for purchase. Dawn bushes, and then there's an hour that is sometimes a small one and sometimes even smaller. And after a minute or two of this, I rush, but not far off. Betrayal is a flimsy cruelty and an inflexible fantasy. Shame is a casualty betrayed by oversight. Real betrayal, free of calm, is only seemingly solitary. There has to be a premise for it, some communication. Accusation flaunts itself from its supposed view of reality. Reality is its defense, and we are drawn like moths to it. We are incompletely lost in speculation, avoiding something to depict. How could there be no pin of blue, no shade of green, no grid of rapid tipping ants? Reality blows by and lives on prey and looks on sky and has now begun. 
How did the rice cam come rattling to the floor? What does the light at the window signify? Perhaps my dear family can profit from my story. As it continues, two pickpockets are denying a robust policeman's suggestion that they are suspiciously encumbered. <clears throat> if encumbered, they assist. They would resemble kids with a lot to say. They would resemble unwanted sympathy. They would not be like holes in a hallway. Oh, popularity, you are great in short-term memory of memory easily fatigued. You are profligate at using people's names, especially those of friends. No bitterness. Our ancestors did it. The walls of Troy are far away. Now to penetrate the mind of a fictional heroine who will not look like me, I am driving to a city I won't bother to name, housing a disintegrating cardboard box, a rusting tricycle, clouds thinly disguised as pine and mane, and long stretches of capricious or sardonic behavior. And there is hurry about it, and I have a large refrigerator. In private, Pablito rolls a ball down the stairs between indifferent walls under a slowing sun in diaspora and in an Africa where pinks confused with white, that only becomes worse with time. Within, I find him playing solitaire. One, two, three, four, four stairs and the door. Memorization, irreverent in spurts, passing strange, oblivious, oblivious to genre, gives him stamina, pleasure, power. It is only because we've never forgotten that we can well remember some Alexander who is in love with some Dorabella. Perhaps you have what I was thinking, I said. Events take longer in my world, she said. I could instruct the children to tree on all sides of trunk planking. I could instruct them to screw up their eyes and pencil their roots illegibly. Go, be almost indistinguishable, cross diameters, be unwiped and stringy and political on pathways. Now turn the page, draw pilots, be unsettled, be weedy. <clears throat> There was once a boy, and he had a younger brother who was mournful. The older boy put a silver saddle on his horse one day, and mounting the horse, turned to the younger and said, Sam, you've won. A thief hidden behind a tree nearby overheard this and said to himself, By tomorrow at this time it will be I who have won. But he was mistaken, as mournfulness cannot be acquired in a day. There was once a poor man who was hungry all the time, how dare you, how dare you, he shouted out the window to people hurrying to the shops on the street below. But experience of disappointment cannot be taught, and the people were deaf to his queries then, just as they are now. There was once a sailor who had so many nicknames he no longer remembered what it was he should be properly called. He sat in the dark and gazed at the sea until his eyes ached, and he wondered why the sea, which resembled an eye, never gazed back at him. But heroic efforts often fail, perhaps because emotion is often a poor teacher. There was once a princess who longed to be a cowboy, but by virtue of her sex, she was kept in the house without any shoes. I'm no more dangerous than a mouse, she said one morning to the miller, who simply pointed to the baited mouse traps with which he protected the flour produced at his mill. Yes. Restlessness is a characteristic of human existence, and neither travel nor rapacity can exhaust it. There was once an astronomer who earned his living by promising glory to the king. On weekends, he sat quietly with his daughter doing math. Efficiency, he told her, is best served by contemplation. Now that was an excellent astronomer, and he is admired in pedagogical circles even today as a man who prepared for every lesson in advance. There was once a doctor who had a kind heart and long fingers, and he lived by himself in a room over a bakery. Everyone likes you plump and warm, the doctor would say to each of his patients, 
which is just what he heard the baker saying to his muffins as he took them out of their tins. And so we see that to a reader in communication with a writer, more and more information is made available. That doctor was a rogue. <laughs> Moral one, we are never the worse for our dreams, and a nightmare should not always be taken as a sign of bad conscience. Moral two, serenity can be achieved through fussiness, although probably only for the fussy. Mm -hmm. Moral three, True justice is never abstract and should therefore not be blindfolded. That's what we can learn from these tales and from other tales, too. Ambivalence may be hidden in any act of kindness or every murky show of weakness thrown between giving and getting to the unforgiving whom one wants to know what one doesn't show in one's dream diminishments of the fullness of life from which one wakes with neither watch nor shoes shouting I've been robbed of sleep of which I've had way too little since childhood which was so long ago it just as well it might just as well have taken place in a dream or between dreams in a gap for which there's no evidence from 7 to 9 p.m. on Wednesday, August 4, when we can get to know our neighbors at a block party with local musicians and a police officer to discuss safety issues. There are measures we can take a little further down the beach, armed with briquettes after gathering driftwood. We can warm ourselves and warn others through the smoke that with the wind off the desert will be driven toward Magadan, where many worked harder than we are doing now and died worse off than we are dying now. But every suffering is incomparable and unique to the woman knowing what the weather was wailing over the dead and specific to the prisoner who knows that everything's misjudged that's paraded through the universe behind men performing the cigar smoking dance or the one stalking a panther or painter or woman panting with invention, since when one invents, it is said that one's navel is attempting to leap off to another place with laughter, taking with it all the money it otherwise holds, hidden just inside the entrance to the belly of life revealed as the curtain that rises, trails threads from its tattered hem over hams fat with layers of meaning, extravagantly and elegantly, but subversively and cruelly imitating contemporary personages whose self-appointed task is to piss on every erect iris, purple violet, tripartite trillium, and tongue of fern growing under the ancient trees, which through binoculars may flatten them, provide bouncing habitats for nesting shocking birds as the cumulonimbus clouds darken deeply overhead, forming pockets for all who have lovingly feared the light of day. <sighs> Catch my breath. <laughs> I am a tattered apology. I have two eyebrows on. Give me wheels. Yes, this is a big wheel. It's a fat one. That's a lot of work for an apology to do. It's a beautiful day. It's time for something. Just as the clock comes silently around to one and another quiets the accusations that the hour lets fall like dull gray rocks down a cliff into the sea, I, an indecent or maybe merely indecisive passerby, guiltily hesitate, or I, an emergency medical technician urged on by schadenfreude, race to the scene where I find another version of the I I am shrieking at my children while brandishing the belt that keeps my pants up, the black ones that I spotted in a catalog and ordered online one night. Typically, I wake three times, i.e. thrice each night to worry. Typically, the worry precedes the thing or things or situation or event or character flaw or flaws or ominous twinge or twinges, etc., that I have come in time to worry about in this life. That's life entering time to worry, is it not? And there, just turning the corner, isn't that 
but it can't be. She's dead, I think. Though with just a few alterations to just a few things, it would be she, and she would be still alive. And finishing a task far ahead of the deadline for sending dreams, which are spells of attraction, in stride, with the right foot just swinging forward, and hand up to knock at the door late at night of the person I want to see with seasonal flowers, a tablecloth, and a platter of melons that awaken nostalgia for wholeness, which many people confuse with desire, and from which many derive resentment, from which in return they contrive their rationale for retribution, vengeance, and fear of wild barbarians tapping at the windows, knocking at the door to the kitchen, demanding dinner, roasted beet soup with creme fraiche, and champagne if they're polite, followed in the deepening dark by Dungeness crab, beside a simple butter lettuce salad, peppered with arugula and nasturtia blossoms and leaves, a baguette cheese, and cold dry white wine poured playfully under the bridge that every dinner table is, as we sit face to face, avoiding eye contact, having nothing to say, making up stories, remembering nothing of the day, which imprecisely dawned and should have been noticed then as it's invented now, if not then as art, answering to life as life answers art. Sights flutter through the dark that links example to explanation that sets the plot, that wakes me up, convinced that this dream of thought is carrying me to someplace very bad. <laughs> We're as unlikely to escape context as weather without bubbles floating on the current and light reflected in the ripples and straws through which to breathe as we snorkel through the undercurrents, torso supple, progress slow as we detach ourselves or are perhaps suddenly separated from our parents if we are young or children if we are old, like puppets from their strings, which is more easily accomplished than the separating of avidly communicating people from their dangling enthusiasms and eager affirmations fervently ex exhaled through the smoke from the meat on the barbecue when the stocky dog, its coat a lovely patchwork, attacks by turns vigorous, graceful, and grotesque, weirdly, decoratively, viciously, and daintily, leaving its 145 traces, some no wider than a hair's breadth, and some an inch wide or wide as a man's thumb, as it presses the key and emits a C in another octave of another caress, unfolding unpredictably, as the lions roar in the adjacent bungalow with which we share a wall, they claw combinations which might just as well have been made on paper with ink and allusions to Picasso's Guernica, Goya's black paintings, or photographs from Abu Ghraib, which Spellcheck can't tolerate and seeks to replace with gherkin, garlic, or Ghana. But perpetrating humiliation and celebrating torture is a far cry, glibly recording crying and resistance, 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 oh, nothing avails. Rising, repeating from ink and painting, I take up a Windsor and Newton very fine sable slash synthetic brush and delicately, even daintily, but not girlishly, dip it into Dr. P. H. Martin's number 25 vermilion synchromatic transparent watercolor and depict Mars, a grisly place, under a bomb to which we go over again, to send over again and again for recognition with burning eyes on film from ruins under a bomb of happenstance, held there, hidden, lifting ruin, buttocks burning, maiden <coughs> melting buttocks there, bomb raised, passerby lifted, bomb sneezing, ruins weather off the river, what river? Every river, weather taken off in mere disagreement largely lacking, history agreeing, and soon forgotten, and nothing exploding but explosion, closer to life than the short fall of the ranging colonel's past life that finds the dearth of creature life available for the local pet store parrots. Parrots? Yes, parroting parrots, toucans, lovebirds, finches, and green budgies dressed in silk, 
for lack of feathers, and disfigured, hot, airlifted, and remade in the cold of the fifty wars and fifty more, with fifty sores and apple cores and more and more. But the good news is that apple seeds do not contain arsenic. The bad news is that apple seeds do contain cyanide. For processing apples, kind of, grinding and pressing against the world, you want to eat, they want to eat, we want to eat, I want to eat, around them cautiously, as we might move through a minefield, envying its treasure stones and anxious for the fate of our own bones, having found their home inside our flesh and trusting to our skin and wisdom on the march and pleasure in our possessions as we puff and splurge, coming back full to bursting, we burst in silence under a cloud, heads in the air. Optically riveted in a jamboree, grievously fixed, oh, theft riveted, things flung and things themselves seen in a spree, go. Things visible, things suddenly free, photographs quali qualify, a crow, a thing in redundant unexpectedness, optimally driven, faultily to know, and quizzically found uncontrollable. January 5, Nietzsche's autobiography. He regards himself as a vivid being and a rule unto himself. I compare this to an intimate account of reality as it's presented by a schizophrenic girl. Progressively during her childhood, she has dimmed as if fading in place. Her living has been immobilized by reality, monstrous and resplendent. Each detail around her has been too vivid to bear. Irritably, she writes, before they show themselves, objects should carefully consider what they are requiring their observers to consider. Testing my own experience against these extremes, I remember that at an early age, I too distinguished myself from reality. This is a common mistake. Perhaps I didn't make it. Reality was ubiquitous, and yet certainly it seemed that only I, though still unknown, was real. I looked out as if from the only real vantage point at a world that was vague and banal and awaited me. Increasingly, I expressed this perception. I wanted to be established. In time, and paradoxically, my very willfulness diminished my singular, initial, original reality. Increasingly then, with bothered, what, what bothered, excited me were the harder details. They were things, evidences, and they became impossible to resist. They existed, moreover, from innumerable points of view. They were expressing the will of the whole world. And yet the will of the whole world was impossible to interpret. The possibilities were infinite. What did the world want? I had always anticipated that it would someday want me. One day I watched a bird land on the shingled roof of an ordinary house in our neighborhood, and the house immediately burst into flame. Figures of smoke billowed at the windows. Dark blue fire shimmered against the pale sky. I heard someone inside screaming. I knew that it was I who had shot a flaming arrow at the bird. This violent conjunction of the imagination with reality, this moment of balance, was precise, effective, and irreversible. A naked woman with wet hair ran from the house into the street. Son, look up. A wet lynx or spotted rat grabbed a dog by misunderstanding it. Ants poured out. A jellied chicken ran across the floor. It burst the confines of the spongy grease on the kitchen sink. The cat was dead, its body stained by the dripping fruits. The window shook. I wheeled under the inspector's gaze, but I made no complaint, taking pleasure even then. What is this turbulent moment from which I can't detach myself? The great fact of thinking is dawn, but that's when I repeat myself. Before dissociation ends, the sunlight flares. Thoughts are leaping from a body that's a mere obstacle to it. Tragedy's wisdom gives way to comedy's heroics. 
What's left is an awful calm, and the laundry in its basket on the path. I can feel my chin becoming another person's chin. I watch the spoon as it rises, then I experience my hands, but who is using them? There's no universe. The universal is an hallucinogenic. What shared life offers is reality, but the only thing my perceptions of it provide are little bits of additional evidence. And though making sense of mute things is a normal thing for language to do, by unnecessarily elaborating the truth to make my story better than it is, I'm using language for defense. People say that's evidence of systematic cheating. That's absurd. I give my eyes to the horse and receive his in return to see out of. The baby D and her brother, the D toddler, wait, more water. <coughs> Sorry. This is a hazard of air travel. It's so dry that in the airplane. The D baby and her brother, the D toddler, and their parents, the young Ds, come knocking at the door last night. The D mother nursed the D baby to sleep. And the D father remembered a book and fetched a copy and presented it to me. The D father and the D mother left the D baby in a small car with a bag of spoons. The toddler D looked like a burglar in a dirty hat with a miner's lamp on his head. A head no bigger than the button on the knob that locks the door onto the open window of the second floor with an eye to getting out that way, whatever the outside temperature may be. A figure warmish even as a problem, D. And then the stars appear after everyone is too dead to hear them, so they jump around near the beginning, which continues to burn at the door, though not one arrived at directly, nor at the end of a straight path that won't disappear into the wholeness and interrelatedness of everything. Toddler D, now boy D, synonymous with a state of being dead, contemplates the transition through the father's dream. Girl D considers the transition synonymous with mortality into birth through the mother's dream. Babies D move in a frozen world, home to each old D in a moving world no longer moving. One night, it might be a moonless night of some year like 1873, the year in which cowboys are all wearing baby blue hats and long baby blue coats to match. Some cowboys come galloping toward me over the horizon like bits of leaping, dust-raising, embodied afternoon sky. They have broken away. They are as free of the sky as they are of the false idea of them we've received from old black and white photos. Their freedom is greater than what occurs during free association. Their freedom surpasses everything that occurs during a flirtation. The cloud of baby blue riders sweeps past me. Their freedom is greater than, any, than my areas longings and yearnings and cloudy desires, which are less great than my rising sense of failure, of remorse, of spreading shame. The cowboys call over their shadow. The cowboys call over their shoulders, come to nothing and the lullaby fades. A girl goes by riding a mulish bicycle in the, with a serenity that is just the opposite of worries die behind it, as behind it. She goes clattering her chain, which is at her source of contemplation service solely as a to pull, to be quite frank. She races by. All right, we're going to finish with this one. A person is expressing sympathy with a television character who is weeping and trapped. 
She is attempting to pummel and scratch her way through a grim, inconsiderate crowd as the woman dolefully frowns. She leans forward slightly. It's an upsetting situation, but a woman should imitate the facial expressions of strangers in order to understand them, though nothing's resolved even then. It's just a premonition of the feelings she's to have, as she has them taken from the world, from a real actor who has just shattered the windows of a new gray Honda sedan parked in the sun in order to get air to a gasping dog mournfully pressing itself against the door of the car on the driver's side. Sympathy requires terrific optimism, bravado, and therefore paranoia. Already I regret having singled the woman out. Thanks.